Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. And hello everybody out there in podcast land. Thank you for tuning back in to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. I am your host, thriller author Jason A. Meiske, and thank you so much for coming back week after week. If all goes well, this is our inaugural episode up on the new podcast host. Uh, We have migrated over, and this should be our first episode on there, so hopefully everything's working, and hopefully uh, hopefully you are hearing this. But uh, anyway, I'm I'm happy to be uh, moved over. Uh, Thank you so much to Podcast Garden for having hosted us for as long as they have. Uh, they did a great job, and uh, I ha- highly recommend if somebody who's new looking to start a podcast, that's a great place to begin. But anyway, I do want to thank everybody for just sticking it out with us. I do want to make sure to point everybody over to our Facebook and Twitter page. That is the Sample Chapter Podcast on Facebook.com. Chapter Sample on Twitter is our handle. If you want to contact us through any of those ways, you can. And if you need to contact us through email, it is samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. Shoot me a message using any of those methods. Let me know if you have an author that you would like for me to talk to. If you are an author and you would like to come on and read a sample chapter from your book, yes, yes, yes. Reach out to me and let me know. I would love to have you come on the show. You know, if there's somebody you would like to recommend, let me know as well. Uh, That's been a lot of fun with this is I've actually had a few people who have sent me messages and put me in contact with other authors. And so that's been that's been a lot of fun. It's been really great to uh, to do it that way. But I do like hearing directly from the authors themselves. And if if none of those things are what's interesting, you, if you just want to reach out and say something about, hey, this episode was great. Hey, you know what? You've been doing a great job. Hey, Jason you need to get a life, (laughs) whatever it is you want to say, that's fine. You can shoot me an email or contact me through any of those methods. And I'll be happy to uh, chat back and forth with you. Uh, As always, you know, you can head on over to wherever it is you listen to our show and leave us a rating. That's a great way to uh, to communicate with us as well. Uh, We've been picking up a few more ratings lately on iTunes. So I'm looking forward to getting some more. So if you like the show, that's a great place to go is over on iTunes and let us know what you think. I would really appreciate it. I do need to thank our sponsor, which is you store all of Warrensburg, Missouri. They are the premier place to go for self storage, whether you are looking for non climate control or climate control, they have it all. It's a fully fenced in facility, gated access, 24 hour video surveillance on more than 40 cameras. The climate control is a true climate control, meaning it has air conditioning, heating, and dehumidification. The building's locked up outside office hours for added security, but they do work on with customers on a case-by-case basis to let you in after hours uh, up to 10 p.m. So, you know, security is the name of their game. If you want to make sure that your, your goods are going to be there when you come back for it, <laughs> and who doesn't want that? then you store all is the place to go check them out online at you store all.net that is the letter u s t o r a l l dot net i am not going to take a lot of time with all that you know i want to get that out of the way because i want to get us on over to this week's guest yes you saw the name on the uh, the title you saw her picture oh man i'm i'm just i'm blown away our, our first ever celebrity guest Diane Franklin, the iconic 80s actress from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Better Off Dead, The Last American Virgin, Amityville 2. I mean, the list goes on. I've seen her in all these movies. I've seen some of her TV shows. I remember after I read her book, I remember seeing some of the commercials that she was on when she was younger. And it was like, oh my gosh, I remember that. Uh, yeah, Diane Franklin, and you know, and of course, there's what? Well, what's she doing here? This is a book show. Well, this is because she wrote a book. <laughs> She's got two books so far, uh, both of them. Uh, she not only wrote them, but she also put them out as an independent publisher. You know, she did this all herself. So just like as I feel, a lot of you out there listening to this show are indies. Well, 
there you go. You've got a celebrity who's right there in the game with you. You know, she learned how to write it, how to publish it, how to, you know, get it prepared, get her photos set up the way she wanted. This is awesome. It's so cool. Her first book is The Excellent Adventures of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s, <laughs> which is is totally awesome. Uh, during the interview, you're going to hear that I was in the process of writing the book. I have since finished it. It's awesome. I put my rating up on Goodreads and Amazon, which is something you need to do too. Book lovers, authors, you know, everybody loves getting a good rating. And whenever you read a, a book, whether it's good or not, make sure you give that feedback. So I've already got mine up there. Her next one I haven't picked up yet, but I do plan to. It is The Excellent Curls of The Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s, Diane Franklin Book 2, or Volume 2. Uh, that one came out last year, and she's in the process of working on Book 3, which dives into her work on Better Off Dead. So <laughs> it's... Oh man, it's it's I can't wait to pick all these up. We have a fantastic conversation. She gives some really really great advice on writing. So for all you writers out there, she gives some great advice on that. She we discuss the importance of titles. You know, she has these very long titles and she's got a reason. Come make these mummies, honey. <laughs> Sorry about that. Apparently it's almost time for dinner. We also discussed the importance of titles and, you know, what the thought process was that went into the title that she gave her books. And she has a fantastic quote, which is, there is no perfect time to start writing. Oh my gosh. It's, it's so, such an amazing interview and it's going to go long. Uh, it's just longer than our usual episodes, but I think you're going to find a lot of real quality in everything Diane has to say. And, you know, for, for anybody who's, um, we'll say old, older than, I don't know, 35, like I am. I'm, I'm just barely over that. <laughs> uh, you know, you're going to find a lot of nostalgia in what she's talking about, you know, and for everybody out there too, there's also a fantastic invitation. Uh, if you want to be a part of her third book, she has an invitation for you. So make sure you're listening all the way to the end. So you hear what that invitation is. If you want to take part in this book, or if you want to uh, join her in the book and, and have a little special piece of it, then, uh, you know, listen to it. I, I don't want to waste any more time. I had so much fun. It's been a great time just listening to the episode over and over again as I edit and get it ready for you. So, and apparently I need to go make dinner. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Miss Diane Franklin. And hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Man, what a radical show I have for you today. <laughs> I'm I'm still speechless. I've been talking with my my guest today for a little while, and I'm just I'm just so excited. I can't wait for you to meet her. So, hold up your boombox, slip on those Ray Bans, and don't forget to spray on a little more Aquanet. It's iconic '80s American actress Diane Franklin. Diane, welcome to the show. Oh, I am so excited. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Jason. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. Well, for for the younger audience out there who may not know who you are, uh, the yeah. people not old like me, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Okay, young audience, listen to this. <laughs> I'm going to start backwards. I, You may know me, or your parents may know me, from a movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures, where I played Princess Joanna, a princess, and I talk like this with an English accent. I played opposite Keanu Reeves, and it was with Alex Winter, and Kimberly Cates played my uh, princess sister. So if you look me up on the internet, um, you will see me as a princess. And the cool thing about it is that for the new audience, that they are thinking, or they're trying to do a Bill and Ted's 3. They will do a Bill and Ted's 3 next year, and hopefully I will be a princess in it as well. So there's something current for you to look forward to, um, for me to be back in the Bill and Ted's world. Um, totally excellent. So that is a film you may know. Also, you might know me from a film called Better Off Dead. I play a French girl, Monique Jeunet, or Jeunet, and uh, I think for years I've said Jeunet, but it's Jeunet. And I um, was working opposite John Cusack, and it was the first, uh, one of the early films he did, I think it may be the third or second film, 
And we, I play Monique, and I am an awesome female role model. Uh, I can't even tell you. I mean, if relate, for girls, uh, that character was the best. So I definitely recommend you seeing it. It's a comedy, not a horror film. It's called Better Off Dead. And all I can tell you is, uh, if your parents don't know it um, and you don't know it, you should all sit down and watch it because it is hilarious. And it is a cult hit. I mean, it was. it is actually where all the Nickelodeon shows came from. So if you ever watch Nickelodeon, you will see that they start, that sense of humor started with Better Off Dead and was actually created by Dan Schneider, who was Ricky, Ricky, and uh, on the show, he actually created Schneider's Bakery. So from, I mean, all that sense of humor on Nickelodeon originated from Better Off Dead, um, which was directed and written by Savage Steve Holland, who has done animation. He did Eat the Cat, and you can look into his thing, any cartoons. Uh, he's done a lot of animation. And now, for those of you a little bit older, you may know me from a movie called Amityville 2, where I play the daughter in the film. I was 20 years old when I did it. But now up, I will be, uh, just this month, there's a screening and there's, it's going to actually come out on digital on November 13th, Amityville Murders. So you also, uh, if you're looking and you don't know who I am, you will see me in Amityville Murders. I play the mother. And for those of you who know the film, I, it's the best acting I've done in my entire life. And I am so excited to be playing this character. And I am the only actress who has ever played a daughter, the daughter and the mother in the same uh, series, the Amityville series, the mother and the daughter, but it's in the same story. So you will uh, see me die twice. Spoiler alert. But um, the, basically, the Amityville Murders is uh, based on the true story. And so I play Louise DeFeo. So it's based on um, the, the the guy who's 23 murders his family. And that is a true story. So based on the facts of this. So I'm very excited for Amityville Murders on so many different levels. And then for those of you maybe who from the 80s who would like your children to have, for your boys especially, an education, sex education as well as a love introduction to the, the trials and tribulations of love, there is the film Last American Virgin. And that is an 80s cult film that is, it actually played at Lincoln Center, but it is not, I would say it's not for under 18, but can I just say that people have shown their 12-year-olds this film? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I always ask where were your parents when this film came out? Um, but it is definitely uh, 80 subject matter and deals with abortion and it deals with sex and there's nudity and all kinds of stuff. So, but I do think it's a a great film for kids and it's got the best 80 soundtrack, the best 80s clothes. It is really a time capsule of the 80s. So if your kid wants to know what the 80s is like in a real way. Let them watch that film. So there's my introduction to those who don't know the film, and hopefully that took people on a memory down memory lane. <laughs> yes, I think we've I think we've got all the genres or all the uh, generations throughout there. I know, and and I remember every bit of it. <laughs> all uh -huh. of those. <laughs> that is awesome. Now for the entire listening audience, what is really great, and and the reason I got to have uh, I was so honored to have Diane come on is you've also written a couple of books. Yes. And this is awesome. Thank you for and noticing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because, I mean, obviously, as an actress, I'm, I'm, that's my primary thing. But, my gosh, you can actually go back in time with these books, which is so exciting. It's very yes. exciting. Yes. Yes. And, and that's, I mean, these books are, really are like a time capsule. I'm, uh, I think, uh, according to my Kindle, I'm about 65% of the way through the first one. And I'm gonna. I was gonna read the uh, the title, but I will let you because you do it so well. So what what's the title of your first one? Okay, okay. So this is my first one. The first one is called uh, Diane Franklin because my name was never associated in. Um, I never publicized my name when I was acting in the '80s. You, if you saw my work, then you knew who I was. You had to like watch my work to know I was. But I, but I never put it out. And obviously today, you know, this is much more common. Um, but it was in the '80s. You didn't have your name out there much because people wanted to. You wanted to work more. And if you became if you became too famous by your name, then either you were typecast or people would be focusing on your private life and not who you were. Uh, not the film. The film is. You know, when you go see a film, if you don't know who that person is, 
you are much more absorbed in a story. But, you know, if you start seeing people on the screen and you go, oh, I know who they dated and I know how many kids they have and they live here and they have this big mansion, it's like you start not believing the story. So to me, um, that this is why, like, right now, I mean, in fact, I never even thought I would necessarily be, necessarily be acting again. So when I put all this out, I thought, oh, this is, you know, no one else. This is a time where I can talk about my name because who will know me? And then now all this acting work is coming up presently, so that's hilarious. Um, but the first book <laughs> is called Diane Franklin, The Excellent Adventures of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s. Uh, so I, the, I, it's a very long title, title. I remember telling a friend of mine that I wanted to name my book that, and they go, went, well, you're not serious about that, right? And I'm like, I am absolutely serious about what that, because every person I tell, they laugh, because they make sure, you know, it should put you in a, in the spirit of what the book is, it will feel like. And, um, I also use the name, the word babe, because it's an 80s word, you know, and, so even yeah. though like somewhat people might go, ooh, you know, it's a sexist. We don't want to, you know, talk about women that way. To me, it's a direct reference to how girls were talked about or seen in the 80s. You're a babe. You know, that was a compliment, mm -hmm. you know. And I think to this oh, yeah. day, I mean, if people call me a babe, that's a compliment because I'm in my 50s <laughs> now. So I'll be a babe. Yeah, that's sure. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, right? <laughs> what we once turned into, oh, my gosh, do not call me a babe, becomes now like, oh, my God, it's okay. Definitely you can call me a babe. So um, uh, it's kind of a, a funny thing. And it also comes from um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures, where we were uh, medieval babes. So um, the idea that the title of the book um, was very specific and, and, and really, to me, was an example of my personality. Well, and it's certainly going to stand out. I, I know for every episode, I have the author's name and then the book title that we're that we're discussing. And this is going to be fun to be typing this one uh, out yeah. and to see get people's reactions when they see the, the title. But it, so, but it, it grabs people's attention. Yeah. It makes them look at this and go, "Okay, I have an idea of what this book is about," which is what right. you want. You want people exactly. to know. Exactly. And this is a wonderfully nostalgic trip down memory lane of your history as an actress, yes. correct? Yes. And I think, uh, and I, I, for again, for the new audience, I think what's great about it is it's a great uh, example of, like, if you don't know anything about the 80s, my gosh, you're going to have so much fun. You're going to watch these and go, oh, my gosh, I get that, and I like that, and that's funny, and you will, you will have a, you'll have a clear understanding of what it was like during the 80s and what it was ex my experience as an actress and as a young woman. I think sometimes we get, you know, we get a lot of gossip in these books, but mine is like, what if you were an actor and would you have made the choices I did? And did you have, do you have dreams too? And, and would you, what would you do if you had these dreams and you had to make these choices? And I feel like, you know, I, and I talk about every aspect that I, I've all the, all the work I've done. Sometimes actors are like, look at this, but don't look at that. And I really feel like, you mm. know what? Honestly, if you did it, you gotta, you gotta back it. Like, I mean, I don't know. Like you just gotta, you know, this is the actor's life. And I really want people to understand um, that's why not everybody is an actor. You know, you could be a very talented person or maybe why not everyone's a writer, right? Or whatever you know, job I know, like a lot of people, little girls want to be vets. A lot of kids want, oh, I want to be a vet. And then they suddenly find out what that takes and they go, you know what? That's not me. So I really feel like, you know, everybody wants to be an actor, an actress. It's like you could want to be it. You may be very talented, but you may not want to live the life. And I think that that's a really important distinction. And it, and it creates a lot of respect for those who have done it. And also you get settled in yourself and going, you know what? I, I didn't want to do that and I'm glad I didn't because that really wasn't me. So, um, I think there's closure to that as well. But what mm. I find it just funny is because I've written a couple of books and I'm actually planning to do a third, I think what's interesting is that you can always just look up Diane Franklin book and that makes it easier. So like if you look up Diane Franklin book on the internet, you will find my books. So you don't have mm -hmm. to worry. I mean, it's funny, like even my daughter, she has a screenplay she's written and they're going to produce it. And I said to her, you know, I always find a noun in your title. You got to have a noun because it gets you to visualize the title of the book. And um, sometimes verbs are, we don't hold on to it. But if you have visualization like a stone or a, a babe, or I don't know, something that's a noun, it just gets you to visualize. So that's just my little Two cent, my two dollars, <laughs> my two dollars. All right. So we have my first book. We're focusing on that. And this book, all the chapters are rated 
um, in, in 80s form. So in the 80s, we would have rated PG-13, or we would have rated R, um, or we rated X. But in my book, what I did was I rated the chapters PG-13, or PG, or R, um, or G, general audience, based on what the films are, so that if you bought the book, you could say to your kid, look, you can only read the PG-13 ones, and then the R is for me. And R meant over, th- <laughs> oh, over 17 with a parent, or I have to sit and talk to you about it, you know, as a parent. So, uh, because of the subject matter. And um, because I work with kids also, I, I teach kids, I'm very sensitive about it. And I have my own kids, you know, it's like, I, I'm very respectful for the fact that sometimes you don't want that information to be in your kid's hands unless you explain it or unless we discuss it. But the entire book, my first book has nothing, you know, X rated or anything bad. Like it's just, it is, but I am very sensitive to people having it. So, so I know that people who have kids will get it. So, um, I, in my first book, I am definitely uh, aware of that. So you don't have to worry parents. It's, it's, it's rated. <laughs> Yeah, and and as somebody who's who's in the process of reading, I mean, I, it, it's not Fifty Shades of right. Grey, it, it's or, or Fifty Shades of Franklin. Right. It's uh, yeah, it's, funny, <laughs> it's, right? it's just on, an honest look at uh, the, the subject matters and the, the things that you were dealing Good. with, Great. Thank and you. the things you were going. Very through. well put. Very nice. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, it's funny, like this generation and the world. You know, they'll probably read it and go, what was she talking about? I don't even know. I've seen worse on the Internet. And rightly so, you know, so um, yeah. rightly so. Uh, so well, yeah. what, what I'm what I'm really finding that's a lot of fun and, and it kind of goes back to like we were talking about. So like the younger generation who watch Better Off Dead, they're going to see actors in that movie who they know today and they're going, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know that person and that person. And that yeah. person. Just like just like me. I'm reading the book and I'm going, I remember that Coke commercial. I remember oh, that that commercial that you did. Yeah, you know, right? I'm going like, oh my gosh, yeah, com- things. Right? Remember? Or, yes, sure things things I didn't even know. But it's like a snapshot in my memory. I'm going back to remembering my childhood in the house my parents had at that time. I'm going, like, I remember oh that. Gosh. Oh my gosh, this is. And so isn't cool. this? Isn't it like you're? It's almost like you went to high school with me, and you go, oh yeah, I remember. Now, like we're watching her grow up, and like here she's now doing this. And I mean, to me, it always felt like. I always experienced that with the other actresses I acted with as I grew up. Like, I grew up with, um, like, who had the same manager, Elizabeth Shue, who was Lisa Shue at the time to me, and Lori Loughlin was with the same manager, and Brooke Shields, and, and like, all, uh, Ali Sheedy, like, we all grew up and, and went auditions at the same time. And then when you, when, when I see, like their work and I see what they do now, I felt like it feels like I went to high school with them because it feels like we've yeah. all sort of grown up together and you start seeing what, you know, some people give it up and some people keep going. And um, it's just interesting. It's yeah. more, it's cool, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something that was really cool about this too, that, that became something that I have in common with you and, and a lot of other writers out there who might be listening to this, uh, something that uh, you have in common with Diane, mm-hmm. perhaps, is that you you wrote this as an indie. So you did this, you put it all yep. together, and then you published I it yourself. I typically self-published it myself because I actually saw some books. I, I, you know how you go to the bookstore and you look around, and I looked at other actors' books, and I, I, was, I saw these books. Like I saw a Molly Ringwald book, which was like makeup tips, and I thought, oh, my gosh, you go to a publisher, and when they see it, they go, oh, well, just put your name on it, you know, and people buy anything with your name on it. And I, and I, sh- I saw like she got some not good reviews because people were disappointed. They wanted to see her. They want to see her makeup tips. Mm. And so when, so I started looking around and saying, you know what? I, I had many objectives. My objective really was one for people to get a primary source of information. Like they could go, this isn't, I mean, look, there are a lot of actresses out there. So I'm going, if someone looks at my book and they want to see what it's like to be an eighties actress, I want them to, me to be the primary source. I want the words to come out of my mouth and it to be in my phrasing and not to be in the phrasing of, of a editor, you know, and that's, you know, I can talk to my editor and say, I just keep, I would say to him, like, don't change too much because even if it doesn't sound completely correct, it is how I spoke during that time. It is my voice, you know, and it's how I, I, I mean, I really tried to make it as much. I didn't talk down to myself. I, didn't, I remember the time when I was a young child <laughs> at the age. Of, you know what I mean? No, it's like you know, yeah. this is a tour. You know, I just came. I tried to write it as if I was in that experience, 
And so you get the feeling of what it was like to speak to me in the 80s and what it was like in the 80s. So that was my first reason for not publishing. Also, I wanted to put a lot of pictures in my books. And there's always a restriction on that. And um, because I, I wanted to do the layout, I knew that it would be, I just knew I could do it better. And I did the layout. I, I you know, um, I did the, I got the photos. I got the rights to the photos. I mean, I really, it was a labor of love. And I think you can see that in the book. And I think this is why so many people love it. And, you know, there are the only criticism I've had sometimes where people say, I wish there was more. And that's the greatest criticism all. Like, you want more, you know? So yeah. I wrote a second book and I have some, and I plan to do a third book and I'll tell you about that at the end. But, um, you know, I think it's just because I've had such a, a rich life and there's so much, I have so much to say. Um, but I really feel like, you know, I want to go deep into what my life is, you know, and that takes time. So. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So now, and as you said, then you wrote a second book, which dives into the, some more of this, which was a, a fascinating subject. I did not <laughs> oh. realize, but once I, once I looked into this, I realized like you're totally right. So right? tell us about, uh, tell us about the second okay. book, the title and, and what this okay, is. So about. I read the first book, right? I'm done with that. I'm thinking I've said, I've said everything. I'm okay. And as I started to look through photos, all of a sudden it hit me and I went, oh my gosh, I, I, and this is why it was so funny. I started looking at old press kits and my press kits were saying things like, I'm the girl who brought 80s curly hair, you know, fashionable. I'm the one who made this, you know, curly hair wasn't happening. And all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I have to write this second book because I was the first actress to make 80s dark curly hair as a teen, beautiful. And there was no curly hair teens that was considered beautiful. I was the first one. And I'm going to specify this. What happened was I had been modeling for 10 years before the 80s and or nine years. And when I did it, I always had to straighten my hair. And my second book is about how I even started when I was a kid. It was always straighten, always straighten your hair. And I was looking for that curly haired actress to be my role model. You know, there's so many girls who are out there who are, have curly hair and they just don't feel pretty. They feel like, oh, my hair is frizzy, ugly. It was one of those curly hair was considered bushy. Um, it was not considered, you know, attractive. There were no products for curly hair. It was the pariah of life. You know, it was really uh, honestly like at that age. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't understand why or what, but I knew that you know, um, even in Summer Girl, when I did Summer Girl, you know, it was like I, they had to ugly me up and they had to like make my hair really like frizzy, you know, and uh, originally in this movie of the week. And then what happened was I had most of my life, I, I was born with naturally curly hair. And I'm going to read a chapter uh, from my actual, my first book to explain it. But my second book really focuses on, well, actually, I should probably do that for my first, wait a minute, no. No, actually, I'm going to, uh, one of the passages is from my second book about my curly hair. And so basically what happened was I straightened my hair all through the 70s. The only other actress I saw with curly hair was Amy Irving from Carrie. And she was supposed to be the beautiful curly haired teen. But in my eyes, she was a lot older. Like she was like, she looked like she was maybe in her 20s or, not, you know, and, and the other thing was she wasn't the star of Carrie. So it, it didn't, it didn't, curly hair did not hit in the 70s. But the minute I did the film, Last American Virgin, I got lead after lead after lead, and they always wanted my curly hair. And it was unbelievable. <laughs> and I remember saying, this is it. And then in that hit made perms happen. There often, all of a sudden, there was ethnic diversity, and uh, we had flash dance, and all this stuff started hitting. And I was the only one sitting here, and I swear to you, I was like going, this is... This is unbelievable. And often all the girls that I knew who had curly hair, like Sarah Jessica Parker, and I mean, I knew that they had curly hair and everyone was straightening it. They started wearing their curly hair, you know, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> what? what's happening? Wait, what? I... And so I was talking about you. So I'll read it to you. It was so funny. And I have proof of it in my book. And when you read it, you'll go, oh, I see. And it's just because I lived it. And I thought, you know, I got to call it because I lived it and it was hilarious and really truly what it made me so happy is it made curly hair can be considered beautiful as a teenager and again there was not to say that I was the first person who ever had curly hair but it was like Lucille Ball and 
When I was growing up in the 70s, Lucio Ball or Bernadette Peters, they were adults with curly hair. It was funny at best. Like, no team. Everyone <laughs> wanted to look like Marsha Brady. I mean, I'm sorry, blonde hair, blue eyes, that was it. That was the American look. <laughs> so I turned yep. that look in the 80s, and I realized it. So, I mean, I would always be, you know, I bet, you know, um, I mean, the only person I have to say who really loved that curly hair was Steven, Steven Spielberg, who was dating Amy Irving at the time. I was like, you go. I mean, I remember <laughs> thinking that, like, you go, Steven, because you picked a curly hair girl <laughs> as your girlfriend. So... Uh, anyway, uh, so I have so I have you to thank for uh, the years of uh, my mom giving me. Oh yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> for all of you that got perms, I am sorry. I totally apologize. And yes, it was my fault. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, that's all right. It, it worked out. So. As it got later into the '80s, and then it turned into the mullet. And yeah. I, I oh yeah. Okay. It, good. So there you right. go. See, right. <laughs> so. And this is and this is all part of your your second book, which is uh, let me see here. I'll yeah, try it. Go for it. <clears throat> the excellent curls of the excellent curls of the last American French exchange babe of the exactly. 80s. So we just went from excellent adventures to excellent curls. So you get to there see we it. go. And the cover of the book, which will it will probably uh, you know show in a little bit more. Um, my second book also focuses more on last American virgin because that was the main the movie that made everything come out. So if you are a Last American Virgin mm. fan, you'll really want to get my second book. The first book, again, covers all of my films, but the second one, ooh, you'll love it. And and I have some great photos <laughs> in it. I mean, photos you will never see anywhere that you're going to love. Uh, it's really, really funny. So now, have you have you always wanted to write? Has this been something oh, you were always interested great in? Great question. No, no, absolutely not. In <laughs> fact, I wasn't a reader. Um, I wasn't a, uh, and I'll tell you why I wasn't a reader because I was, I, I think I was, I don't want to say really dyslexic, but there was definitely a, a reading difficulty when I was young. Um, I had, I needed reading help when I was like maybe in fourth grade or third, you know, I had to go to specialty reading stuff. Um, and in fact, because of that, I used to memorize my dialogue for films and, and scripts because I couldn't trust myself uh, to read, I, you know, read and uh, read as much. But I, but I learned little tricks and I got better at it. And then as a writer, I was too intimidated. I mean, oh my gosh, I'm, I could never ever think of myself as being a writer. But here is the cool part. So I decided as an actress that, I mean, I, I, even though I was an actress professionally, I wound up going to get my college degree and I decided to major in English. First, I wanted to major in biochemistry. I wanted to go into science in college. But then I had to stop college to act. And when I came back, I thought, you know, I want to major in English because I thought maybe it would be, wouldn't it be very cool with me, with all the acting experience I have to be an English teacher? Like to go to my class and go, oh my gosh, I'm going to let my kids experience drama in the class. So I originally, so what happened is I went and started as an English major, and that's when I learned to write. The I irony is, though, even though I learned to become an, a, a, you know, major in English, um, the irony was that you're not allowed to teach drama as an English teacher. A drama teacher has to come in. So, <laughs> so, then, so I was like, oh, what? So I have just, I've become a credential drama teacher, which is hilarious. So I do work with kids as that. But I, but what was ha funny was I learned to write when I was an English major, and that's what gave me the confidence to write my books. So I just graduated in 2017, people. Yeah, I got my. I, Congratulations! Thank you so much. That's so awesome. So never too old. You're never too old to finish your degree, and you're never too old to get information. And so it, it became applicable. Like I actually learned to write, and I think the greatest thing about learning to write, what I didn't know before I became a writer and learned to write, was wh when you write, we're talking, people talk about their voice. And so what you have to learn is not only how the, the grammar of writing, but you have to learn how it, it, it's not, you're, you're, you're showing who you are in your writing. And so all the grammar that you're writing is going to be very, it's sort of conversational. And you are writing as yourself, and so you have to know yourself to write. Or you have to know your, and you have, if you're going to write stories, you have to know your characters, and you have to know their voices. And when I write, I do, um, I, first I do my sort of like 
I write, write, write everything down, just everything I want to include. And then I'll take, I'll take different paths. I'll take a factual path. I'll take a tone path. I'll take a moral path. I mean, you might write all these things and at the end you might go, what was I saying? Did I make a point? I mean, what do I really want to say, right? <laughs> it's like, so right. that's what takes so much time in writing. It's not the words and it's, it's not the, um, necessarily, it's not necessarily the facts, but it's like, in the end, did you say what you wanted to say? Does the audience come away with the feeling? And the message that you want to say. So I found, I find writing so enjoyable now because I understand the process and I enjoy the process and it takes a while. I mean, I got to say my books take, you know, a couple of years to write because it, I need to step away from it. I need to write and I would write in the mm. car. Like I remember like writing my first book, you know, my kids would have a soccer game and I'd be writing in like the car, like I'd be mean, like writing or taking notes or like in my computer would be the like soccer game and type it. Or, you know, I mean I'd go, Yay, go live your zone and then I'd be like typing down, right? Um so you know, there's never a perfect time to write. I always brought it with me when I had that free time and um mm-hmm. or, or use my phone and take down notes and um bring my computer with me. And so when I had a free moment, then I would do it. So that's my process. Uh, there's ne- there was never a time where it was like, oh, perfect. Oh, I got the time to write. No one's going to bother me. I hate to say this, but that d- I, does not exist. <laughs> not in the real world. Right? <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, something something that's come up on the show several times, and as a friend of mine, uh, an author friend of mine likes to say, we, we write in the cracks of mm-hmm. life, and that's the, the best way to get it down. I, I know for me, whenever I wanted to get serious, I had to give up some of my, my morning routines. I would wake up and watch what was on my DVR yes. or maybe maybe play a game. And I realized when, when my first grandchild was born, that's when I was like, okay, that's over. Wait. i got to get busy and because uh, life's going to yep. get away and I've got stories I wanted to tell. No, exactly. them, so. You want, you want yeah. to tell them before you forget. And you want to tell them. But I mean, for me, I, that's another thing. I was like, i got to write this before I go. Who am I? What's happening? You never know, you know. Um, and Yeah, and, sh- and share your yes, legacy. You know, just – and. And be brave and have guts. I really believe as you get older, you get braver. I mean, I, I feel that way. Um, and you have more guts and you go, you know what? This has to be said. This story has to be told. Um, so I would say Absolutely. don't, if you're waiting for the perfect time to write a story, forget it. It won't happen. You need to write it in, the, you know, you need to start putting notes down everywhere. And it's so funny. My husband is actually a writer. He, um, he writes for, uh, he wrote for Fairly Odd Parents for 14 years and he wrote Harry and the Hendersons and he wrote for TV and film and, um, he wrote St. Elsewhere back a long time ago for episodes of the show and I've seen him in his process and he writes when he surfs. He writes when he surfs. He thinks about his stories when he does exercise. When, uh, I write and think about when I'm driving in my car. You know, you, you do a lot of thinking before you even touch mm-hmm. the keyboard. And, uh, that's what makes it good because uh, it's very important not to get too tight at the beginning. You've got to stay loose. So. Yes. Anyway. You well, you've got, you've got your two nonfictions yep. right now. I know, I know you're working on another. Yeah. Uh, will we see any fiction coming from? Oh, you know, that's such a fun, oh, that's such a fun, uh, question. Because somebody said to me, oh, I want to see your screenplay or your story, you know? <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, you know, I, I have a couple of ideas of these autobiographies, um, and I'm explaining, so my, my third book, and I'll give you the heads up. My first two books are, um, Books I would say you wouldn't give your to your 14 year old, but my third book is going to focus on Better Off Dead, and it's going to be an homage oh, to yes. it. So I really want that book. To, it's going to be about female role modeling. It's going to be about it's something you can show to your kids. Um, and the main reason I'm doing it is I've been doing conventions for like I don't know eight to ten years, and when I go to these conventions, I brought my Better Off Dead coat book. I mean my my not my coat book, my yeah. coat. So. I, oh, yeah, I would yeah. have my aunt, people who at the convention. So if you hear this and you, you can come to a convention, do um, follow me on the internet because if I have a convention, you can come and there's still time to you try on and you take a picture with the coat or you have a picture with me with the coat and I will have you if you send it to me, tell me the convention and your name and those of you who have, if you've ever done it, do that, send it to me um, and I'll give you the email address. Uh, I will put you in my book. 
And so that, so it's going to be all this. And the key reason why I want to do this is this coat has united anybody who's worn this coat loves Better Off Dead and is united with the love of this film. And this film is a love story. It's a comedy. And so, um, I talked to Savage Steve Holland. He's going to do the, uh, the forward for me again, but this time, you know, he's going to have a, I'm going to ask him to put more in and either I'm going to see if my, uh, the other cast members are going to do interviews as well for me, or I will talk to about what it was like to work with each of these people in different chapters mm. because my you know, experience of working with them. So it, it's, yeah. it, it is going to be a love fest. Uh, so if, oh if you gosh. have pictures and again, if I come to a film festival, I haven't, I'm not, um, I, I don't think it's going to be out until next, like maybe 2020 because I want to give people a chance to send me their photos, but it is, it's going to be called the excellent coat. Of the last American French student very <laughs> lovely. <laughs> so big on that. And, and if you have a picture of, of, of the coat, um, or you have one, if you're listening to this and you've met me, then send it to b o d coat book at gmail dot com. So b o d coat book at gmail dot com, and that is the book that I I feel is going to be my most sort of uh, G fest, unless of course. If I get cast in Bill and Ted's too, then then we'll have a Bill and Ted's book too. So, um, and I will have to do an Amityville book now. You have them in both of them, so we'll see. It might go on and on. There so. you go. Yes, <laughs> yes. You have a wonderful series yeah. started so up here. Funny. You have <laughs> book after you collect them all, right? Um, so, there you go. Anyway, but um, <laughs> oh my gosh, I have had so much fun talking to you. Uh, this has been so wonderful for me, and I really appreciate that you came on. Yeah. Uh, I am so looking forward to to hearing. I've already read, you know, the one, so I can't wait to hear you read oh, it. Uh, you know, pieces from each one. Where can people follow you, and uh, and and what do you have coming okay. up? Okay, so I strongly recommend whoever's listening to this, even if you don't know who I am, but who is this woman? Follow me because I have so many things going on that are like they're going to be big. And like legit, you've got to follow me. So, okay, I'll tell you why. Okay. So first of all, you can go to, on Twitter, go to Diane Franklin 80, no S, 8-O, okay? Then you can follow me on Diane Frank, uh, actress, oh, I'm sorry, on Instagram, go to actress Diane Franklin. Um, and on Facebook, go to, go to Diane Franklin fans. And this is on, there's too many apps. <laughs> this is on Facebook, but it's on the group <laughs> thing. So look for the group thing because my regular Diane Franklin Facebook is full. There's too many apps. Diane Franklin mm. Facebook is full. So, um, go to, yeah, Diane Franklin fans on the group page. Okay. Now, okay. these are the things that are going on right now. One is I have Amityville Murders coming out, which is a huge film. I think it's going, I really believe it's going to be a huge hit. Um, it just got chosen to screen at Scream Fest on no, October 9th. It's, it has been chosen as the film to open up the film festival. And Scream Fest is in Los Angeles at the Chinese Man Theater. It's like where Groman's Chinese is. And it is, this film festival is considered to be on the, the sun, Sundance of Heart. So it's very well esteemed. And some very big films have come out of it. Of that film festival. So they're choosing to open it and it is the only film that they are showing on the first, uh, night. Whereas all the other nights they're showing a lot of other films, but ours is the only one premiering and there'll be a red carpet. So that is very exciting. Um, plus the actors in it are amazing. I have to tell you, honestly, I think the Amityville Murders is going to be, is like, is the best film they've put out of Amityville because it is based on the true story, the facts, and it's very scary. So, um, it's not gory. So, I mean, I understand that horror is very boutique and people have different criteria for it, but it's going to be very scary. It's very well acted. And I have to say, um, it's the best performance I have done in my entire life. So just from the standpoint of, I just, I think in the entire series, really, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. And when does that come out? Okay. So here's what's happening. I don't know if it's coming out in theaters. Because they, the, whoever's doing the distribution, this is their first time they're doing it. Mm. Um, and they were saying to me they weren't quite sure of their distribution deal there. But it will come out on 
digital. Like, I mean, or, or you can, you'll be able to see it. It's not a Blu-ray. It's like you'll be able to upload it, stream it mm-hmm. on November 13th, which is the anniversary of the murders. It's the 44th anniversary oh. of the murders. So they knew that they definitely wanted a digital release that day. So you'll be able to see this. Everybody on the 14th, they can pull it up and watch it. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. So anyway. That's coming up. Then if they do Bill and Ted's three this year, I will let you know if you're following me, if I'm going to be in it. Um, also, I do a, um, my daughter is, uh, we do a YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel called Live, which is my daughter's name is Olivia and Die, of course, Diane in LA. <laughs> so if you want to see our YouTube show, which is this is just our relationship and she's a filmmaker and she's 22 and I am, uh, you know, an actress. What it's like to have an acting mom. This is like a very kind of, it's kind of a funny show. It's like, what if your mom's like a super babe? Like what happens? And so it's a, it's a very funny, uh, YouTube channel show. Also, if you, um, connect with me, she, my daughter actually just she acts, writes, and directs her own stuff. So you can see my daughter, and she looks and speaks very much like me, which is hilarious. Um, but she does comedy. And she, if you look up on YouTube, Barely Legal Comedy, you better put the comedy in, guys, because if you don't, just do Barely Legal. I'm not responsible, all right? <laughs> not responsible. So put Barely Legal Comedy on YouTube, and you will see my daughter. Her name is Olivia De Laurentiis, and she has a comedy partner named Sydney Heller. And you will see they have a web series called Sugar Babies, and it is hilarious. And I do, I have an episode in there that I've done. I think it's episode three. So you'll see her. So, and her comedy is so great, so funny that an actor, uh, his name is Jerry Trainer, who was in iCarly, he, uh, he asked to do an episode of her, her show because it was so funny. So just letting you know, he's in an episode of it and just so funny. And here's the secret thing. Like, see, if you follow me, like, you're the only person, like, you'll only know this by listening to me. My daughter just got her first film option, and it is, and, and there, it's a comedy, and she's 22, and she is going, she wrote it, but she's going to direct it, and she's acting in it. And I have a small part in it, and so this is, like, inside information before it comes out, but you would be the first, you're the first people to know about this, because... She she just did a press release and it hasn't even come out yet. So I'm telling you, even for it, it happens. So it's like you know what I mean? This inside scoop. I'm like, oh my gosh. Plot. Okay. Yes. Oh and my then gosh. here is. I'm sorry. I'm totally momming out now. We're not even in the reading the book yet, but I'm totally momming out. <laughs> my son who plays the upright bass. He he wants to play. He plays classical and he's going to school for that at DePaul. But he's also in a band and he's an indie band and the band is called Swatches. How appropriate. It's an 80s word. <laughs> Swatches. Yes. Uh, which were like the uh, watches that you used to be able to switch the colored band. Um, but he's yep, in the yep. band and he's got bright red hair. So if you are looking him up, his name is Nick De Laurentiis and he plays in the band Swatches and they just got on Spotify. So I'm like, so, oh my God, my kids, you know, like, <laughs> and my son, my husband's <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like this is just too much going on in family. So. <laughs> It's like crazy and we have crazy and we have like animals. It's like we have a dog and a chinchilla and a mm-hmm. guinea pig and it's just, our guinea pig has a youth, you know, like is on Instagram. You know what I mean? It, our dog's on Instagram. It's just crazy. So whatever. Oh, um, let's get awesome. to the book. Let's get back. There's too many things going on. Oh yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. Diane, thank you oh. so much. I really appreciate you coming on and yes, absolutely. Uh, any of your other books, that whenever they come out, let oh, me know. I'll be happy to have you back. My pleasure. Here. And I'm just clarifying. I have never read my books out loud before. This is the first uh, time I've ever done it. So this is a treat. I'm only going to read a couple of paragraphs from each. So you'll see if you like it. You'll see if you want to read more. Um, well, this is this is definitely a treat for me. And it is it is a true yeah. honor that, that I get to be the first to uh, to have you on and have you read uh, bookstores everywhere out there. If you're listening, you are missing yeah. out. Get this woman in your oh, store. She's got books yes. to sell and people that need to hear about this. Oh my gosh. This. Yeah. I could come into a bookstore so. and I was just telling you before, um, you know, the reason why I've never done a, a reading is because I've done this through create space. Um, it was not done through, um, I think lightning source is where you, if you decided to do your own self publishing and you went through lightning source, 
you can go through Barnes and Noble and they will let you do a book reading and signing. But because I didn't, I was, uh, I'm not able to do one at, as creative space goes through Amazon. And although I did get through Barnes and Noble, Noble, Dot com. I'm not allowed to go to the stores and do a book reading of their independent bookstores. I can. So if anyone is interested, I was really, I really wanted to go to like Book Soup um, or Amoeba. I wanted to go to Amoeba, the record store, actually. And I thought it would be great oh, yeah. to do a reading there because they're so, so cool and happen. They sell some books there. Um, but, you know, if you're listening in L.A., please contact me at actressdianefranklin at gmail.com because I will come and do a book reading um, at the bookstore in L.A. Just Love it. It would be so cool. Anyway. There we go. The you heard it here. So, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, Diane Franklin. All right. So we are we are going to read a clip from my – or a passage from my first book, Diane Franklin, The Excellent Adventures of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s. And the chapter – is um, on Better Off Dead. Um, it's my Better Off Dead chapter, 1985. It's rated PG, parental guidance suggested. Some material not be made suited for children, but that was really the rating uh, at the time in the 1980s. That's what they said. So this chapter starts, and it is called Monique Jeunet. But actually, uh, this is what's really funny before I even start, is it should have been called Monique Jeunet, because um, I just years later realized that I always called it Monique Jeunet, but it was actually in the script written uh, J-U-N-O-T. So there you go. I'm actually doing a typo change <laughs> right as we speak. <laughs> um, but um, okay, here we go. The funniest film I had have ever had the pleasure of working on was better off dead. Hands down, Savage Steve Holland is the most wonderful and inspired comedic filmmaker of the 80s. His film, Better Off Dead, was just genius. It had a groundbreaking script, a true visionary at the helm, a beautiful filming location, and true chemistry between cast and crew. Savage called me in to read for the part of Beth after seeing me in The Last American Virgin. But I had my eye on the character Monique. I had just done a French accent in the film Second Time Lucky, and I was absolutely confident about playing the French exchange student. I adored the script, and I was thrilled to be put up for the part where I didn't have to bear it all. My first thought when reading the script was, wow, finally a movie I would want to see. It's sweet, it's funny, and it's nothing like I've ever seen. I knew I could make Monique realistic, as well as endearing. And I hoped Savage could see this in me as well. I met him and producer Michael Jaffe in a small office in Los Angeles, where they asked me to read for the part of Beth. I did the best with my lines, but I really had my heart set on Monique Jeunot. <laughs> There's something magical that happens when an actor connects to a character. There is no trying, no tension, or neediness in the room. Afterwards, I continued my conversation with Savage and Michael, with a French accent as Monique, and they started to laugh and relax. They could see I owned the character. Savage then directed me to try for a French accent with a lisp to make the character sound more adorable. (laughs) But it didn't work. (laughs) But he was able to see how well we worked together. I felt good when we all shook hands at the end of the audition, and I said au revoir to Savage and Michael on the way out. I went home hoping it would work out. The next day, I got a call. I got the part of Monique Jeunel. Oh, mon Dieu. (laughs) So that is a little chapter from um, Monique, getting the part of Monique. Um, And uh, I will go on and on, but um, I just figured I'd just give you that little piece. And now I'm going to read you a piece from my second book, the, um, this is called The Excellent Curls of the Last American French Exchange Babe of the 80s. All right, here we go. Um, this is a chapter in the middle of the book. It's called The Triumphant Mistake. Okay. It was the fall of 1981 when I entered my second year at NYU. Although I was still acting professionally, I did not want to major in acting. I was paying for college with the money I earned doing modeling and commercial all those years earlier. And I wanted to major in something I couldn't possibly learn outside of school. I loved science and I had dreams of finding the cure for cancer, 
If acting had not been an option early in life, I might have done just that. But even as an actress, I thought if I ever had to play a scientist in a film, I'd understand the character better if I had actually studied the subject. So what did I study and major in at NYU? Biochemistry. <laughs> Up until that semester, however, I had not attended a lecture class of a 100 kids or more. And I assumed, naively, that studying for a midterm would be the same as for any other class. The exam was coming up, so I told my manager not to set up any auditions for me. My plan was to buckle down and devote my time to studying biochemistry. But then, of course, I get a call from my manager that the producers from a film company called Canon Films were holding an audition for a film called The Last American Virgin. It conflicted directly with my midterm. So what did I do? I held my ground. I told my manager to tell the producers I couldn't make it. I was taking a chemistry midterm in the morning, and I could not miss it. At that moment, it was more important for me to pass a test. So that night, I forgot about the audition, made studying a priority, and let my curly hair go. Well, lo and behold, the test was much harder than I had expected. And as I was taking away on the multiple choice questions, I fell deeper and deeper into the realization that I had a much better chance of getting a lead role in a feature film than I did passing the exam. Then it all happened, the moment that affected the rest of my life. I decided to race uptown to make that meeting after all. <laughs> Bus, taxi, running. I finally arrived all the way uptown to the Helmsley Hotel with my curly hair flying. The producers, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, were walking on their way out. They did not even read me. They asked me some questions and told me that director Boaz Davidson had already left on the plane. So they wanted me to screen test for him next week in Los Angeles. It all happened so fast. I just said yes. And the following Tuesday, I was on a plane to Los Angeles preparing for a screen test to play Karen in The Last American Virgin. So there is an example of the first part of the movie, of the audition. And I think I'm going to stop there because it just gets juicier. Does that sound good? <laughs> wow. I mean, really, wow. Thank you so much, Diane Franklin, for coming on the show and reading some samples from both of her books, that was incredible. I highly enjoyed the first book, and I recommend you go out and pick it up. I can't wait to grab a hold of the second book. So make sure you, the listeners, are clicking on those links in the show notes for her Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and her Amazon page so that you can get a copy of the books for yourself. Don't forget to check out Amityville Murders coming November 13th. And don't forget to tune in next week when we have another author, another book, and another sample chapter. We'll see you then. Au revoir.